A Treatise of Satan's Temptations, Part 2 By Richard Gilpin A Discourse of the Malice, Power, Cruelty and Diligence of Satan Of Satan's improving these advantages for error, by diluting the understanding directly, which he doth, 1, by countenancing error from Scripture, of his cunning therein, 2, by specious pretenses of mysteries, and what these are, of personal flatteries, and more. Chapter 3 Part 13. And the matter were yet the less, if there were any just cause for such a prejudice. But such is Satan's art, that if a man explains the same truth, but in different words and forms of speech, than those that others have been used unto. Or if he casts it into a more convenient mould, that, by laying aside doubtful or flexible expressions, it may be more safely guarded from the exceptions of the adversaries. Especially if he carefully choose his path betwixt the extremes on either hand. This is enough for Satan to catch at, and presently he bestows upon him the names of the very errors, which he most strenuously opposeth. Nay, sometimes if he mention anything above the reach or acquaintance of those that hear him, it is well if he escapes the charge of heresy, and that he meets not with a lot of Virgilius, Bishop of Salzburg, who was judged no less than heretical, for venting his opinion concerning the Antipodes. I know men do such things in their zeal. But while they do so, they are concerned to consider how Satan doth abuse their good meaning, to the disservice of truth. As Satan's design in bespattering, the actions and doctrines of good men, is to bring the truth they profess into a suspicion of falsehood, and to advance the contrary errors to the place and credit of truth, so doth he use a skill proportionable to his design. And though he be so impudent, that he will not blush at the contrivance of the most gross and malicious lie, yet withal he is so cunning, that he studiously endeavours some probable rise for his slanders, and commonly he takes this course. 1. First, he doth all he can to corrupt the professors of truth. If riches or honours will tempt them to be proud, high-minded, contentious, or extravagant, he plies them with these weapons. If the pleasures of the flesh and world be more likely to besought them, or to make them sensual, earthly, or loose, he incessantly lays those baits before them. If fears and persecutions can affright them out of duty, if injuries and provocations may prejudice them, into a froward, or wayward temper, he will certainly urge them by such occasions. And when he hath prevailed in any measure, he is sure to aggravate every circumstance to its utmost height, and upon that advantage, to make additions of a great many things, beyond what they can be justly accused of. This old device Paul, in Romans 2:24, takes notice of concerning the Jews, whose breach of the law so dishonored God, that the name of God was blasphemed among the Gentiles through them. The Jews lived wickedly, and their wicked lives was a current argument, among the Gentiles to confirm them in paganism. For they judged the law of God could not approve itself, to be better than their own, when the professors of it were so not. To prevent this mischief, we are seriously warned to be carefully strict in all our stations, that the name of God and His doctrine be not blasphemed, 1 Timothy 6 1, Titus 2 5 2. Secondly, whatever miscarriages any professor of truth is guilty of, Satan takes care that it be presently charged upon all the profession. If any one offend, it is matter of public blame. Much more if any company or party shall run into extravagances, or do actions strange and unjustifiable. Those that agree with them in the general name of their profession, though they differ as far from their wild opinions and practices as their enemies do, shall still be upbraided with their follies. We see this practice daily by differing parties. According to what was foretold in 2 Peter the second 2, false prophets seduce a great number of Christians to follow their pernicious ways, and by reason of their wild, ungodly behavior, the whole way of truth was evil spoken of. 3. Thirdly, the least slip or infirmity of the children of truth the devil is ready to bring upon the stage. And they that will not charge themselves as offenders for very great evils, will yet object, to the disparagement of truth, the smallest mistakes of others, a in the eye of the lovers of truth shall be espied when a beam in the eye of falsehood shall pass for nothing. 4. Fourthly, slanderous aspersions are sometimes raised from a simple mistake of actions, and their grounds or manner of performance, and sometimes from a malicious misrepresentation. The devil seldom acts from a simple mistake. But he will either suborn the passionate opposers, to a willful perverting of the true management of things, or will by a false account of things take the advantage of their prejudice, to make men believe that such things have been said or done which indeed never were. The Christians in the primitive times were reported to be bloody men, and that they did kill men in sacrifice, and did eat their flesh and drink their blood. And this was only occasioned by their doctrine, and use of the sacrament of the body and blood of Christ. 
They were accused for promiscuous uncleanness with one another, and this only because they taught that there was no distinction of male and female, in respect of justification, and that they were all brethren and sisters in Christ. This account Tertullian gives of the calumnies of those times, and others have noted the like occasions of other abuses of them. They were reported to worship the sun, because they in times of persecution were forced to meet early in the fields, and were often seen undispersed at sunrising. They were reported to worship Bacchus and Ceres, because of the elements of bread and wine in the Lord's Supper. If they met in private places, and in the night, it was enough to occasion surmises of conspiracy and rebellion, so ready is Satan to take occasion where none is given. 5. Fifthly, but if none of these are at hand, then a downright lie must do the turn, according to that of Jeremiah 18:18. 18, 18, come and let us devise devices against Jeremiah. And when once the lie is coined, Satan hath officious instruments to spread it, Jeremiah 20:10. report, say they, and we will report it. These were the lies raised against truth. But besides this endeavor, he useth the same art of lying to enhance the credit of error. Lying inspirations, lying signs and wonders we have spoken of. I shall only mention another sort of lying, which is that of forgery, an art which error hath commonly made use of. Sometimes books and writings erroneous have been made to carry the names of men that never knew or saw them. The apostles themselves escaped not these abuses, you read of the counterfeit gospels of Thomas and Bartholomew, the Acts of Peter and Andrew, the Apostolical Constitutions, and a great many more. Later writers have by the like hard usage been forced to father the brats of other men's brains. I might be large in these, but they that please may see more of this in authors that have a purpose discovered the frauds of spurious, suppositious books. The design is obvious, error would by this means adorn itself with the excellent names of men of renown, that so it might pass for good doctrine with the unwary. Thanks.